always good to see if you all are keeping Kevin uh, in line, but uh, I know that's a uh, difficult task for anybody who calls out his wife from the, uh, from the microphone. Uh, you know, it, there's, what can you do about somebody like that? But uh, it's always, uh, always a joy to be with you and uh, spend, uh, spend some time studying God's Word with you. And so I want us to consider this topic that, uh, that we will uh, be looking at this morning. You know, we live in a world... We live in a world that glorifies sin. Would you agree with that? That, uh, that looks at sin and, and doesn't see it as a bad thing, but sees it as a good thing and, and, and glorifies it in, in, in so many ways, uh, in, in as many ways as they can. We live in a world that we're surrounded by evil. We're surrounded by wickedness. We're surrounded by those who look at righteousness and, and just sneer at it. We, we live in a world where, where those who are, are uh, around us are, you know, when, when, you think, when they think about God's law, they, they could care less about that. We live in just a world just full of lawlessness. And, and it doesn't take you long to figure that out. You turn on the television, and what do you find? You find evil, you find sin, you find lawlessness, you find unrighteousness. You get on the internet, and, uh, and you're surrounded by it. You cannot get away from it no matter where you go. Sometimes you go to school, and you're surrounded by it. You go to work, you're surrounded by it. We live in a world that glorifies sin. And so sometimes it's easy for us to just point a finger then. Sometimes it's easy for us to get that finger out and just point it and say, well, you know, they shouldn't be doing that. Well, the world glorifies sin. Well, the world is full of wickedness. And, and it's easy for us to sometimes step back and say, well, we know how bad sin is. We know how evil sin is. We know the, the serious consequences of sin. And, and so because we have a knowledge about sin and maybe they don't really care, it's easy for us to, to kind of point our finger. But this morning, I, I want us to look at this lesson. And I, and I, I don't... I, I want to take a different approach to this topic this morning than maybe was designed for it. When Kevin sent out the topics a while back, I started thinking about how I wanted to develop these topics. And then a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, he sent another email to the speakers. And uh, he said, he reminding us of our topics, uh, is, uh, because sometimes I guess preachers forget what their topics are going to be, but reminding us of what our topics were going to be. And then he had a line in the email that said, just a reminder that when you come, that by and large, the audience is members of the church. And so make sure that your lessons have some application. Make sure your lessons are directed towards those who are members of the church. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know, that's, that's what I want us to do today. Instead of pointing our finger out at the world, which is easy to do, instead of pointing our finger out and saying, those people call sin good, I wonder if sometimes we might do the same thing. I wonder if sometimes we might, by our lives, give the impression that maybe sin's not that bad. And I, I know you hear that question and you hear that statement you think, where's this guy coming from? I don't have a clue what he's saying. That, 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 doesn't, that doesn't apply to me at all. But I, I wonder when we study God's Word, do we sometimes can think about ourselves and maybe we compare ourselves with somebody else? We say, well, I'm not as bad as this other person. And so since I'm not as bad as this other person, then who I am and what I'm doing maybe is not all that bad. Is that what God wants us to do? Is that the standard that God is looking for us to use is to compare my life with somebody else and say, well, as long as I can find somebody who's worse than I am, hey, I'm doing okay. That's not the standard. That's not the standard that God wants us to use. Maybe sometimes in our lives we've been fighting sin for so long. Maybe sometimes we just decide, you know, I'm just going to let it go. I'm not going to fight it anymore. Maybe sometimes for some of us in our lives, we, we look at certain sins and maybe we look at it as, well, that's, that's my little fun thing that I get to do every once in a while. You know, I, 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 uh, I, I, this, is, this is a horrible comparison, but it's the one that just came to mind. Maybe I shouldn't use it. This is a horrible comparison. 
I know on certain diets, there are cheat points that you get. And that you go on a diet and you're supposed, you're supposed to stay on this diet, you're supposed to eat these certain foods, but they allow you to cheat every once in a while. You know, to, as a treat to yourself. You know, you're on this diet and, and, and you're cutting your calories and you're counting all of these things, but, but every once in a while you get to, you get to cheat. And because because you, you, you deserve it, right? You, you deserve a treat every once in a while if, if you're just eating all of this kale and, and all of this salad and all this lettuce. You deserve a treat every once in a while. I wonder if sometimes we might look at sin that way. That we do our best to resist. We do our best to, to stay away from those things of the world and stay away from sin. But I wonder if sometimes even as Christians we might Say, I just am going to give in just so I can have some fun. If that's the way that we might look at sin, as if we're comparing ourselves to somebody else, or, or whether we just say, I don't know that I can fight anymore, or whether we look at it and say, well, this is my little, this is my little fun time that, that I get to have every once in a while. Are we not calling sin good? Are we not perhaps by doing some of those things, think, thinking that sin is not all that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things, if we don't think sin is a big deal, are we then therefore calling sin okay? Or saying that it's good? So here's what I want us to do this morning. I want us to think about this concept instead of looking out at the world and saying, woe is the world because they call sin good. Is it possible as I take a mirror out this morning and look at myself, is it possible that I might at some point call sin good? I want you to think about that for a moment. And, and, and as you think about that, I, I want us to first consider the fact that we need to know that every sin is a big deal. And every sin is not good. Do we, do we know that? I, I, know, I, know that we, I know that we can say that intellectually. Yeah, we, we've got that. But do, but do we have that in our heart? That every sin, not, not just the big sins, but every sin is a big deal. It's, it's only man that has tried to put these into certain levels. You know, it, it's only man that is trying to say, well, this one's a bigger deal than some of these others on the list. But the Bible says that every sin is a big deal. Every sin is not good. How do we know that? Number one, because of the consequences of sin. Every sin is a big deal because the consequences show us that. In Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. The Bible does not divide for us sin into various levels of seriousness. Instead, in Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 2, God says, Your iniquities, another word for, for sins, Your iniquities have separated you from God. Well, which ones? Is it the really bad ones? That have, he, does, he doesn't separate them into categories here, does he? Your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins, which ones, God? Oh, all of them. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. We need to look at the consequences of sin. Stated here that our sin separates from God, and God doesn't say it's only the big ones. God doesn't say it's only certain ones. God says every sin has consequences, and every sin has the same consequences. Every sin's a big deal. And every sin is not good for us. The consequences show us that. The second thing I want us to see is that the cross shows us that. Which sins sent Jesus to the cross? Which sins did Jesus die for? Was it only the big ones? Or was it only the ones that the world commits? Those people that are out there glorifying unrighteousness and glorifying wickedness, it, they're the ones that Jesus, it's their sins that Jesus paid the price for, right? No. Every sin is a big deal. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3, Paul says, I wrote, I, I, I gave to you, I spoke to you, I wrote to you first of all, that which I also received, that Christ Jesus died for our sins. 
according to the scriptures. Which ones? Paul, which ones did Jesus? Oh, he died for every single one of them. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 24, the Bible says that he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Well, which ones? Was it the world's sins? Was it the really wicked people's sins? Was it the big sins? Or was it all of the sins? Even those little, even those sins that I might consider to be, well, they're just not that big of a deal. That sin sent Jesus to the cross. That is a big deal. And I need to see that. I need to see sin for what it is. Sin's a big deal. The consequences show us that. The cross shows us that. In the third place, the, the, the catalogs of sin that the Bible gives show us that. You know what I'm talking about when I talk about the catalogs of sin, the lists of sins? You know, you, you start reading, you start reading, especially in, in, in the New Testament epistles, for one. I mean, you can find it in other places. You go back to Proverbs chapter 6, and you'll find a catalog of sins in Proverbs 6, verse 16 through 19, uh, of seven things that the Lord hates. But you go to places like Romans chapter 1, verses 28 through 32, and you can back it up further than that, but you've got a, a catalog of sins in verses 28 through 32, and, and we might think, well, what's he going to list there? He's going to list murder, and he's going to list adultery, and he's going to list the big ones, and he has those on some other lists. But in Romans chapter 1, he lists things like being disobedient to parents. Say, what? I mean, I, when we think of sins, we're thinking about the big things. We're thinking about being disobedient to parents? Being unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Those are the things that Paul puts in the list in Romans chapter 1 as being those things that will separate us from God. You can go to other lists. You can go to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8, and there you will find some of the big ones. There you will find the murder and, and, and the fornication. But we know Revelation 21 and verse 8, not because of the mur murder and the fornication, but because of the little jingle that we've made up to Revelation 21 8. Like we've made up a song to say what that verse says, that all liars have their part in lake that burns with fire and brimstone. Lying? Only we have put sins into categories to say these are bigger than others. Every sin is is a big deal. We need to see that when you go to Galatians chapter 5 and he talks about the works of the flesh and he talks about some of those things that we might consider be, to be the big sins, he also includes things like envy. Every sin is a big deal. Consequences show us that. The cross shows us that. The, this, the catalog of sins shows us that. And if we were to go back and do some case studies in the, in the Bible, We'd find that just doing some case studies along the lines of people that sinned in the Bible, we'd find it's a big deal. Think about Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus chapter 10. Here's two priests. Here's two religious leaders. Here's two preachers in the church, okay? And, and what do they do? They're in charge of the worship service. And so when it was time for them to get the fire that was needed for, for, for burning of the incense, well, they, they, the Bible says that they offered strange fire, or your Bible might not use the word strange, it might use the word unauthorized. They offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had commanded them not. Well, they had to have fire for, for those things that were, that, that were going to be offered there during their worship assembly. And, and they were supposed to get the fire from the altar. They, they had a specific place that God had told them to keep that fire burning. And that's where they would go and get the fire. But, but I, I don't know what went through Nadab and Abihu's mind that day. I can try to put myself in their position, perhaps. And, and maybe try to think, well, fire's fire, isn't it? I mean, does it really matter if you get fire from the altar, if you get fire over here? Because if I get fire from over here, I get fire from the altar, and I bring it here. Guess what I have? I still have fire. God, it's still fire. What difference does it make where I get the fire from? Doesn't seem like a big deal, right? Was it a big deal? They didn't think it mattered where the fire came from. But guess where fire ended up coming from? Fire ended up coming from above and, and killed him. Why? Because sin is a big deal. 
even ones that we might not think are that big of a deal. You think about Ananias and Sapphira keeping back a portion of the sale of that, of that property that they sold, and that wasn't the sin. The sin was not keeping back a portion. They could have kept back the whole thing. They were not obligated to give anything. But when they presented what they did to the apostles and then falsely presented that, gave the wrong impression that we are giving everything that we made, knowing full well that they weren't giving everything, but for some reason, wanting perhaps a little more credit than they were due. Well, what's the big deal? They were still giving their funds. They were giving money for the goods of the saints. They were doing a good thing. Yeah, but they were doing a good thing and lying about it in the process. Is that a big deal? God says that's a big deal. Does that apply to us today? We look out at the world and we say sin is a big deal because of the, what the world's doing, and that is absolutely true. But what about us? Is sin a big deal for us? Is sin a big deal for those who are children of God? And and. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20 says, Woe to him who calls good evil. Is that only talking about when the world does it? Or is that talking about maybe even when I do it? So I want you to consider this morning, and the title of this lesson is, Woe to those who call sin good. But I want to try to make this personal this morning and say, What about for Christians? Woe to those Christians who live like sin is good. Who live like sin is not a big deal. Now, I know somebody's here this morning, or maybe more than one somebody, they're saying, are you kidding me? I'm here on Sunday morning. I, I am a Christian. I didn't wait until 10 o'clock to get here. I got here at 9 o'clock for Bible study. I understand that sin is, is a big deal. I understand the consequences of sin. I understand that, that, that God looks at sin and, and sees it as a major thing. I understand that. But do we understand it about every sin? Or are there some sins that maybe we think are not that big of a deal? I stepped on my toes a little bit as I was thinking through this particular point. And it's possible I might step on somebody's toes here this morning. But the Bible says that there are a number of things that are sin that maybe we don't always think it about. I want you to consider that maybe there are too many Christians today who are living like partiality is not a sin. You know partiality, right? Partiality is when we give favor to a certain person or group of persons over another. When we show favoritism is another word. When the, the old King James word talked about showing respect of persons. And when I was a kid, I had no clue what that meant. Because I thought respect was a good thing. Uh, and being a respecter of persons, I thought was a good thing. And then I grew up and thought, oh, learn, nope, that's not a good thing. Partiality is not a good thing. Showing favoritism is not a good thing. When I, as a child of God put some people in one group and some people in another group because of skin color. That's not a good thing. When I separate individuals and say, well, these, these, these are different. These people have different value be, because of their economic status. That's not a good thing. When I look at individuals and I say, well, they're not as good as others because they're one gender and they're another gender. That's not a good thing. When I try to separate individuals, I say, well, I, 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 I'm, I, I think these people are okay, but I don't think these people are okay because of their political views. We're showing partiality. And the Bible says when I show partiality, and, and when I separate those groups, and not just separate those groups, but when I separate a group and I say, I like this group more than I like this group. I think this group is, 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 a, little, is, is a little more you know, acceptable to me than some other group. God said, do you know James chapter 2 and verse 9? Do you know that verse? You, James chapter 2 and verse 9 is a verse that you need to have underlined in your Bible. 
In the context of James chapter 2, we know, we know maybe the last 13 verses of James 2, maybe better than we know the first 13 verses of James 2 because we talk about faith and works quite a bit. But the first 13 verses of James chapter 2 illustrate for us an occasion where the idea, the idea is that there's someone who comes into the assembly who's wealthy, somebody who comes into the assembly who's well-to-do, and boy, we just, we, oh, you come over here, you sit with me, sit you know, I usually have the in seat on the pew, but boy, I'm glad you're here. You can have my in seat. I'm so glad this well-to-do person is here. Maybe they'll become a member of this church and pay off the building and just come and sit next to me. We show favoritism to certain groups of people. You know what James chapter 2 and verse 9 says? If you, look at the verse, if you, you show favoritism, partiality, depending on your translation. If you show partiality, you commit sin. How many things in your Bible does God say this is, and he uses the word sin? How many things in your Bible? Now, we know that there are a whole host of things that are sins, but how often does God say this is? is S-I-N. And would you have thought that partiality would have been one of those things? Brother and sister in Christ, we don't need to point the finger out at the world and say shame on you for living in sin if we ourselves are showing partiality, showing favoritism to some group of people or some person because of some particular attribute that they have or some particular belief that they hold. We need to be careful. We need to make sure that we go in the opposite direction of showing partiality, lest we be confused as someone who does. I want us to think about it. Woe to a child of God who says partiality is not a big deal. But tied right along with this, and, 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 and I know these things are familiar to all of us, but to all of us, but I think categorized right with this is, is there are too many Christians who are living like hatred is not a sin. I don't know how many of you are on Facebook, but I am stunned by the number of Christians that I see on Facebook who are just venomous in their comments about certain individuals. We are living, I know we can point the finger out at, the, at, our, at our society and say, look at the world we live in that is just boiling with hatred. I, I, I'm seeing hatred more in our culture today, you know, than I have in the last 10 years. It just seems to be just growing and boiling, and, and we're just, and it's being fed. You turn on the television, and guess what you're going to get fed? You're going to get fed a dose of hatred so that you become full of hatred yourself. And you're just going to hate people just because you're just going to hate people because that's what you're supposed to do today. And so we hate this person because, well, they're, 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 we hate the president, whether it's the past president or the current president. It's, it doesn't matter. You can just hate the president. That's okay. You hate this senator. You hate that senator because of, you know, this, this or that. You hate this. Wait a minute. And as a Christian, is that right for me to be somebody who has a heart that's full of hatred? In the listing of the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5. Oh, sure, you're going, to find, you're going to find those big things, but do you know the verse 20 includes hatred as one of the works of the flesh? And it's interesting, in the works of the flesh, he not only gives a catalog of sins, but in verse 21 he says, and such like. Here's these lists, and here's hatred included, and then he says, and something like this. Well, I don't hate people. Well, do you do something like Hating people, because that's included too. And verse 21, the Bible says, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I've got to take a mirror out this morning. And I've got to look in my heart. And I've got to say, do I ever exhibit or express a heart of hatred towards others? The Bible says that I am to imitate God. The Bible says that I am to imitate Christ. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, the Bible says that God is love. 
I'm not talking this morning about whether we, whether we love the, the sinner or hate the sin. Uh, obviously, there's a, a differentiation there. I'm talking about towards people. The Bible says our God is love. God doesn't love sin, but God loves people. Which people does God love? Oh, he loves them all. What responsibility do I have to exhibit a godly love towards every person that I meet? That's what Jesus would do. That's what I've got to do. Too many Christians living like partiality. Uh, not that big of a deal. Too many Christians living like oh, hatred. Not that big of a deal. Too many Christians might want to pull your toes in. Living like gossip. Oh, that's, gossip, that's not a big deal. Just this past week, just this past week, somebody came to me, said, I heard this. I heard this. Somebody, somebody at church told me this, and I, I just I couldn't believe it was true, and I had to come and ask you if it was true. It was something they heard about somebody else in the church, that somebody heard something about somebody else in the church, so they told somebody else, and this somebody else came and asked me, I can't believe this is true. Can you tell me if this is true? You know what I said to that person? Go away. I said, you don't need to be coming to me. This is not for you and me to be discussing. For you to come to me and ask me, is this true about this other person? Because you heard it from somebody else? We have a responsibility if we feel a need to confirm some information to go directly to that person themselves. That's what Matthew 18 and verse 15 says. Not to go to somebody else and, did you hear? Not to go to somebody, did you hear? Did you hear? And it, by the way, do you hear me? Are you listening? It doesn't matter if the information is true or if the information is false. Sometimes people say, well, I, I understand if, if it's wrong. We, we shouldn't be spreading wrong. You know, we shouldn't be spreading false rumors. That's not right. But if it's true, wait a, what, wait a minute. If it's true, that gives me the right to talk about that information with other people in the church? That's, that's not what the Bible teaches. There are a number of verses that we could look at, and we don't have time to investigate all of them, but I, I think 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 13 is one of the most telling, where it's there talking about widows in the church. Somebody looks at that and says, well, that applies to widows. I'm not a widow, so it doesn't apply to me. Oh, really? Is that, is that the way that it works? God, God, God makes certain rules, certain laws in the church for, for widows, but he doesn't make them for you? Uh, I don't think so. Because you'll find these passages in other places, uh, and, and first Timothy, or first Peter chapter 4 and verse 15. And, but First Timothy chapter 5, verse 13, talking about widows, that they are not to be gossips or busybodies. You go over to 1 Peter chapter 4, and it doesn't use the word gossips, but it does use the word busybodies. Isn't that a descriptive word? That here is somebody who is a busy body. Why? Because they are a body who is busy in other people's business. That's what they're doing. But 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 13 says, You're not to be gossips or busy bodies. And then I like what the end of the verse says. What is a gossip or a busy body? It is somebody who says things they ought not. We don't have a right to go around talking about other individuals. Whether that information be true or false, the Bible calls that gossip. The Bible calls that being a busybody. And I don't need to live like that's not a big deal, like that's not a sin. There's too many Christians. We can go down that list of sins that are bad. This one, this one we might just say, well, that's just not my strength. I'm just not good at that. I'm going to leave that up to somebody else who can do that. You know, sometimes we consider sins to be those things that God puts in those lists. Well, I, I haven't murdered, and I, and I haven't stolen, and I haven't committed adultery, and I, and I, haven't, I, haven't, uh, I haven't gossiped, so check that off. I'm not gossiping, and, and I haven't done this. And we look at these lists. I haven't done all of those things. Well, what about the things that God commands us to do that we don't do? Is that a big deal? Well, James chapter 4 and verse 17. That's a verse we ought to know. 
Because not only does James 2 and verse 9 say, here's something that equals sin. Partiality equals sin. But you go two chapters later into James chapter 4 and verse 17, and God says something else equals sin. What is it? To him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it equals sin. What does that mean? God says that when I am told to do something by the God of heaven, and I don't do it, God says it's sin. Preachers for a long time have talked about sins of commission and sins of omission. There are those sins of commission where we commit an act of lawlessness. 1 John 3 and verse 4, that's what sin is. Sin is lawlessness. Where we commit an act that violates the will of God by something that we choose to do. That's a sin of commission. But then there are sins of omission. Where I don't do anything. God, I didn't do anything. You, did your kids ever say that? I didn't do anything. God, I didn't do anything. And God says, that's exactly right. I told you to do something, and you haven't done it. And James 4, verse 17 says, that's sin. Well, what can we put on that list of things that we've got to do? The one that's on the screen. Jesus says, go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. What if I don't do that? What if I'm standing before Jesus on the day of judgment? And he asked me, he asked you. He says to me, David, did you teach anybody the gospel? Well, Jesus, you know, that just really wasn't my strong suit. There were other people in the church. They, they, were, they were more skilled at that. I mean, we, we've, we've got Kevin. We've got Frank Parker. We, we've got elders. We've got individuals. that That's what they're good at. And, 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 and Jesus, I just, I just felt inept. I just really did. I, just, I, I wasn't any good at that, so I just thought I'd leave that for other people to do. How do you think that's going to work on the Day of Judgment? Or for anything else that the Lord calls upon us to do, and that we choose not to do. There are sins of omission that we need to consider in our lives and not live like sin is not a big deal. And we don't have time to look at everything that I, that, that I, that I wanted to talk about this morning and to put on the screen, and, and I, knew, I knew we wouldn't have time. But there are other things, are there not, that you could put on a list. So here are some things that we're living like, perhaps, these are not big deals. Later on in this series, and so I chose not to dwell on it, but later on in this series is, is talking about sexual immorality. What does our world think about sexual immorality? Ah, not a big deal. Hey, it's, just, it's, it's just a normal thing. You know, two people who are not married to each other having sex, that's just, that's just, as, that's just as normal as getting up and, and eating breakfast these days. That's just eat, no, no big deal. Is it a big deal to us? When, it, when a young man and a young woman say, well, we, we need to find out if we're compatible with each other, so we're going to live with each other for a while and see if this works out. That's not what the Bible teaches. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4 says, marriage, marriage is honorable among all. Marriage, not shacking up. Marriage is honorable among all. And the bed, which one, God? The marriage bed. Not the shacked up bed. Not the one night stand bed. The marriage bed is undefiled. Well, what's the big deal, God? Fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. That's the big deal. We don't need to be ashamed to teach that. We don't need to be ashamed to teach that to our children. We don't need to be ashamed to teach that to new converts. That these things are a big deal. And again, I knew we wouldn't get to the rest of the list, so there's some other things. I mean, you go down the list of things. And how many times as Christians are we maybe living like, eh, no big deal. When we allow bitterness to dwell in our hearts, 
Is that a big deal? When we live lives that, that, that are focused on what I want and, and, and are selfish by nature, is that a big deal? I understand that we look out at the world and we say, Woe to the world for calling sin good. But brother and sister in Christ, may I plead with us not to get that finger wagging so hard at others that we forget to look back at ourselves and say, wait a minute. By the life that I am living, maybe I don't, obviously not a single person in this room today calls sin good. We would never do that. But what about by the way that we live? By the way that we live, the choices that we make, are we perhaps saying sin is, eh, this one's not that big of a deal. This one might be okay. As we close this morning, I want to ask you, I want, to, I want us to answer this question. What can we do about it? I don't want to end on that note uh, of all of these lists of sins for us to be mindful of as Christians. But, I mean, that, that's, that would be a, a very difficult place to leave the lesson. I want us to leave on a positive note. I want us to leave on, on a mo moving forward note. Say, what, what can we do about it? What can we as Christians do about the plague of sin that's not just out in the world? Guess what? The devil doesn't stop at the church door. The devil doesn't stop when you get baptized. When, when you hang up a plaque in your house, when you hang up your baptismal certificate and say, I got baptized, the devil doesn't look at that and say, oh, well, never mind, I'll leave them alone. That's not the way it works. So what can we do about this? Let, let, let me suggest just a few things as we close this morning. First of all, we need to draw near to God. That's the solution to everything, isn't it? Draw near to God. And when we draw near to God, He will draw near to us, is what James chapter 4 and verse 8 teaches. You know, it's awfully hard to sin when you're next to God and when He's next to you. Did you ever get, well, don't raise your hand, Kevin. Did you all ever get in trouble in school? Did you ever get in trouble in school? Did, did, you know what some, you know what sometimes the teacher did when you got in trouble in school? You, 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 you come and sit right up here next to me. Well, why'd you have to go sit up next? Because it's harder to, it's harder to misbehave, not impossible, right? It's harder to misbehave when you're up next to the teacher, right? You ever get in trouble at home and your mom says, get over here. Why? It's harder to misbehave when you're sitting right next to mom. It's harder to sin when you're sitting right next to God. You don't want to. When you're right next to Jesus, you don't want to sin. It has no appeal to you. Let's draw near to God. Second thing, we need to see sin the way God sees sin. Not the way the world sees sin. Not the way we've manufactured a view of sin. We need to see sin the way God sees sin. We need to see that sin sent Jesus to the cross. That in and of itself ought to make us not want to have anything to do with it. Him who knew no sin became sin for us. We need to see sin the way God sees sin. That it's the only thing. You know the only thing that's going to keep you out of heaven? The only thing that's going to keep any of us out of heaven is S-I-N. That's it. We need to see sin the way that God sees sin. What, what can we do about this? We need to put God's word in our heart. David said in Psalm, 9, Psalm 119, Thy word have I hidden in my heart. Why? Why would you do that? That I might not sin against you. John said in 1 John 2 and verse 1, These things I have written to you, little children. John, why are you writing? Why are you giving us inspired text? 1 John 2 and verse 1, These things I write to you, my little children, that you might not not sin. That's why we've got the Bible. And if we take the Bible and put it into our hearts, what did Jesus do every time he was tempted to do wrong? Quoted scripture. Where did he get that from? Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. We need to get God's word into our hearts and into our lives. We need to watch and pray. Isn't that what Jesus told his disciples? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Isn't that what Jesus told us to pray? That we pray, lead us not into temptation? How often do you pray that? God, help me to stay away from sin. Help me to stay away from temptation. But God, when those temptations do come, God, help me to run away from them. 
2 Timothy, Timothy chapter 2 and verse 22, that's what it says, to flee it, to run away, to abandon, get away. And, and as you're fleeing, look for God's way of escape, the one he has promised us. He's promised us that he, he will give us a way of escape. How often do we look for it? Sometimes we don't want to find it. Sometimes, well, I'm just kind of enjoying this. I, I, don't, I don't want to. Get, we need to find the escape route to get away from those things that are going to separate us from God. And then finally, we need to walk with the Lord every day to try to love what God loves, to try to learn to hate what God hates. Woe to the world because they call sin good. But brother and sister in Christ, woe to us if we live like sin is not a big deal. Thank you very much for your good attention this morning.